Hey guys, it's that time again, Detour Live, and the old band's back together. I'm joined by four-time national road champion Johnny Trevorrow and Olympic gold medalist Scotty McGrory. Uh, fellas, let's uh, start by unpacking a, a pretty epic stage at the Vuelta. Um, you know, we thought going into it, it was going to be a bit of a ding-dong battle between Roglic and Carapaz, but Hugh Carthy, Scotty, pulled one out of the box. That was pretty bloody impressive. It, was, it is impressive, but, uh, you know, and look, it's up to the riders to decide what they think of this, but the, the Angular Roo, which is that final climb, which is a brute, you know, they talk about it being the most difficult climb in professional cycling. Um, and it was honestly like slow motion TV, watching them climb, come up that final climb, just brutally slow and, you know, almost um, painful to watch. But, uh, yeah, Hukarthi did a great performance to come away with the stage win. Um, he looked fantastic. It was Enric Mass that was the first to go, but, um, yeah, just this arm wrestle, isn't it, between the top guys on a climb that, that steep. And, and Roglic looked like he faltered and started to struggle, but you don't lose that much time because they're all going so slow anyway. So uh, it's quite an interesting thing. Marcel Wust um, put up a post because, uh, you know, he's a former you know, German superstar sprint champion. He won four stages um, before the stage that went to the Angulu in 1999, the first time they ever went up it, and it was wet that day. He said he used a triple chain ring because you know, it was unheard of to go up climbs that steep back then. Um, so I think he was riding something like 3026 was the chain ring cassette combination that he had running. And he said if he was in the saddle, the front wheel just kept coming up. And when he got uh. out of the saddle, when he got out of the saddle, the back wheel would just spin because the roads were wet and so slippery. Um, <laughs> so it's almost not cycling, but that's a debate that you know, the riders can perhaps uh, talk about if they want. I, I said to uh, George uh, about last night, I said, listen, mate, if I had had that back – in our day, I would have had to ride up with 42.28. He said, nah, you would have been walking. <laughs> <laughs> well, one thing that we've said on the show a number of times is how emotional riders are getting at the finish. Well, old Hugh Carthy, he was the opposite. I, I want to show some footage of him crossing the line. It's like, eh. Here we go. Yeah. <laughs> Everything is with her. She has everything. Go with her. Congratulations. Yeah, just you know, he smashes a, smirk, a, a smirk. A little smirk. Yeah, and then got. the the post race interview, I love it because um, who's the French guy that does all the interviews? I think he was doing the stuff at the Giro. Um, uh, quick, uh, quick, 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 Jeff. Uh, uh, Jeff, Jeff, yeah, Jeff, nah, yeah. Jeff, yeah, Jeff. Um, anyway, he's he's started pretty good with his standard question, but his middle one was a bit of a stinker. And old Hugh plays it with a straight bat. Your first Grand Tour victory, and it is Longlieu. How good is that? Uh, it's a dream come true to win. Any, any race, any professional race is a dream come true, but to win in the Grand Tour on a mythical climb, yeah, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't get any better than that. It's, uh, yeah, it's hard to put into words. 1.2 kilometer to go, you chose to change rhythm. Was that a good time? Uh, it looks like, yeah, I won the stage. And now four riders in 30 seconds on GC. How does it look for the last week? Uh, exciting. I think I think for the public, it's uh, everything they want. A close race going into the Tantra, uh, and I think everything is uh, everything to play for. Thank you. That must have rattled him because he's like, "Well, yeah, I won the stage. Of course, it was a good move. <laughs> <laughs> Sensational stuff. Some great questions. <laughs> um, if you look at the betting, so the punters for the overall, Roglic still dollar twenty five, Carapaz four dollars, but the big mover, mover is Carthy. He's in from fourteen dollars to six fifty. Um, wh what do you think is going to happen with the last week? Obviously, we've got a time trial. I'll be honest with you, lads. I haven't really previewed the stages, so I'm hoping done a little bit more research but uh what are you expecting scooter for this last week uh well let's start with the time trial because they have a rest day obviously today for for them but uh, and then straight back into it with the tt it's 33.7 kilometers roglic obviously the favorite of the gc guys to do well he's been consistent winning grand tour time trials previously so yeah, i expect him to, to to be the best of the gc guys if not win the stage then definitely be the best of the gc guys but and you look at someone like Hugh Carthy, he's a bit gangly, you know, tall. He looks like sort of, you know, just 
purely a climber, but he's actually not too bad against the yeah. the clock. So um, he might surprise a few. I, I don't think he's going to be, com- be, compete with Roglic in the TT, but, you know, against the other guys, Carapaz and um, uh, also Dan Martin. And the, the next one that's probably close enough to really con- still contend is Enric Maas. Uh, Maas has done a couple of good time trials, and Hugh Carthy certainly has. At the Giro last year, Carthy... Um, he finished eighth in the 34k time trial um, that Roglic won, um, and he beat Carapaz in that as well. So eighth in a Grand Tour time trial last year. He's definitely going better than he was last year, and, um, and he was good in that Giro. Finished 11th overall. So carthy has got some good legs. So I expect him maybe to go second best out of the GC guys, but I think it's Roglic back into the jersey after the TT. Yeah, I if agree. He... It's pretty flat TT, except the last 2K. It's got a real good little sting in the tail, which would suit, uh, well, suit all the GC guys, I suppose, but Roglic most of all. I expect him to win that time trial uh, tomorrow. Um, and I reckon you did right. I reckon uh, uh, Carthy could end up mo- moving into second place after that because Carapaz is not bad, but I think Carthy's definitely going to go better. Uh, but then it's still going to be. Nothing in it. I mean, I, I wouldn't expect uh, Carapaz to lose more than say thirty seconds, maybe forty, to to uh, to Roglic. Uh, could lose a couple, bit of a fraction more, but I reckon it'd be around about that. So he'd still be thirty seconds down. And then the last week of this tour is nowhere near as tough as what we've had, but there are still climbing days to come. I don't think there's anything there that will crack Roglic, especially with Jumbo Visma being so strong. So if he does the time trial, we all think tomorrow. He's going to be very hard to beat in this world. And uh, Jus- Jum- Jusmo, Jumbo Visma were super bloody strong. We said to George Bennett before the start, every time he comes on the show, he has an, a really good ride. He was sensational, and so was uh, Sepp Kuss. Yeah, they're, they've been so important uh, uh, to... to uh, uh, to a pretty much, just, you know, in, in every bike race he wins, really, the team's been so strong. Uh, Kuss, as I mentioned, is just this year has just been amazing. His ride in Tour de France was brilliant, and when it really comes to the crunch, you, you see, see him bridging gaps, doing everything that's needed. So that's why I think uh, that uh, Primoz Roglic is going to be so hard to beat. But as you said, George. He's been on the time he comes on the show. He does a really good ride, so uh, he's probably keen to come on again. <laughs> Oh, yeah, we'll, we'll try and milk it as much as we can in this last week for sure. <laughs> um, I, I, think, I think Primos will be a minute. I'll, I'll give him a minute after the TT up, and then the biggest challenge to any of his contenders is that strength of the team. So anyone that wants to, that has to go on the attack to try and get back, whatever it is, you know, 40 seconds, as you say, Johnny, I say 60, who knows. Um, they've got to overcome the might of, of the you know, Yumbo Visma team, which I just don't think anyone can. Hey, Scotty, I want to ask you as a rider, like, what's surprising everyone is how long Roglic has been good for. You know, normally, how long would you have window-wise to be on top form um, throughout a season? Well, if you go back to, so anyone that's tried to win, you know, two Grand Tours in a season, you know, anyone that's gone tried to go back-to-back, so as it was, in the, you know, if we go back to the real world before, um, or the normal world before COVID, it was the Giro into the Tour. And the last person to do that was Marco Pantani in, 1980, in 1998. So it's been, or it's virtually been impossible for anyone to do that since then. So there's 12 years that people, some people have tried. So what they have done is maybe tried for the Giro and then the Vuelta and missed the Tour to give themselves that time to come back up again. Obviously a very unique season. Um, so I think everybody's very surprised. It's not just the Tour that, you know, Primoz maybe, okay, finished second in the Tour but obviously on great form all the way through and showing that he's still got great form now, but he also won the Crow Team to Dauphiné before the tour. So he's, it's not that he's just mm. been going since the start of the tour. It's also several weeks before that. So this has been an extraordinary performance by Primoz, regardless of where he runs in, in all of these races. And plus Liège uh, in the middle. So he's just had no back off time <laughs> and a great mm. worlds as well. So yeah, he, he's just been up, up to uh, scratch the whole way. Yeah. Johnny, it'll be interesting next year, won't it, to see – how he is next year, because this has been an extraordinary run from him. You know, is this going to be damaging to him? Is this the best we'll ever see of him? Or is this just going to make him so much stronger? Um, it'll be intriguing 2021. Uh, we've got no, a few I think, comments. I think we'll be better. I think, I, I think we haven't seen the best of him yet, actually. Mm. Yeah. We've got a few comments coming in. Uh, Sam says, Mitch will be so happy on your EF. Hugh is such a straight shooter. Apparently, his chain ring was really hard compared to Roglic. So he must have been riding a bigger gear, was he? Bigger gear. 
Yeah, perhaps mm-hmm. I'm not 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 that sure. You know that. Uh, look, so I'm still I'm based at the moment. I'm still in Bendigo, and um, <clears throat> you know, I guess from our training group and our uh, community of cycling here in Bendigo, we should take some credit for this because Hugh did come to Bendigo for a training camp with the old Rafa Condor JLT team, 2014, I think it was. Okay. Um, so he started that season here in Bendigo, as that team used to come out here so often. Yeah. He won the Tour of Korea that year. I think he was second in the Tour of Japan, which set him up to go into the pros, which has led him now to this stage win at the Vuelta. So a lot of it's got to do with us here in Bendigo, of course. Well, he said, you know, he actually said something about that, you know, the, this is his first uh, uh, Grand Tour win, and it's taken him six years to recover from Bendigo, he said. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we've got another comment from the Will Wizard. He says, Scott, what's with the facial growth is for transplants for you all? Definitely not the same guy I saw racing around the, how do you pronounce that? Kipke. 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 Kipke with my favourite Belgian, Matty Gilmore. And then he's yeah. followed it up with, and Scott, using an Australian term, you look shite house. <laughs> uh, oh, yeah, that's, that's a mixed metaphor that one <laughs> great, to, great to hear from the fans um yeah oh, the good work thank you um yeah. yeah so so yeah what is with the facial hair um i shaved it off so i look at this the covid beard right so i grew the covid beard this year and um i have i myself haven't got used to it at all however my partner won't let me shave it off she thinks she she thinks she tells me she likes it and I did shave it recently because my daughters don't like it, um, and I copped it from I copped it from the missus to uh, to grow it back. So it's coming back. Mm. It's not and, about me; it's about the others. Hey John, what is going on in the background there? I, I, I got a, I got a, a guess. What, no, I got a guess. I got to stick his head in. You know, when we were talking uh, with Elby the other day, and suddenly yeah. my grandson stuck his head in, and I said, because uh, uh, I said, "I oh, get Elby." Well, my grandson's name is Elby. Oh, so and that's why right. and that's why he stuck his head in the other day. He was just here then. I was gonna drag him in. But anyway, uh, okay. I'm about that. Um, and you, you had a great birthday, didn't you? I missed you guys since the, your, oh, your sorry. son's birthday, 40th. Yes, yesterday, day. yes, yeah, yeah. then I was 40th yesterday. Great day. Yeah. Johnny's on a four-day bender. So yep. strap yourself in, folks. Uh Tom Maloney. He says, Hi guys. Sean Kelly was asked about young tour winners. He compared it to uh, mature juniors not making it when they go to seniors. I'm uh, making it. Uh, he said it will depend on how they mature in the next few years. What do you think about that? Start with you, Scotty. So as in uh, these young guys that are doing so well, how are they going to be in another four, five, six years? Is that I think so, yeah. Kind of the gist of it? Yeah, well, who knows? That's the, they're just so much more. And if I go back to when I was in the Institute of Sport, so that was obviously the, you know, the, the Australian Institute of Sport was the, um, I guess, the model that the British um, Institute took on and then took it to another level. And we thought we were doing well. We were we were doing things you know better than anyone else at the time. But as athletes, I felt that we were very immature. I know I was. I didn't really understand, um, you know, all of the the power data and the heart rate and all those things. We were told what to do, rather than being empowered to educate yourself about what to do and learn about yourself. You were always told this is how you should respond from these efforts and this sort of training. Um, whereas I think all these young guys now, as we've heard it so many times from a lot of the experts, that they know they really understand their bodies they're so well trained from even from under 17s before you go into under 19s and that transition from 17s to 19s there's a massive drop off especially with the with the girls unfortunately um, because obviously the career prospects and the money made from women cycling is far less than the men unfortunately so there's a big drop off of athletes from under 17s to 19s the lads a little bit different um, and they're very well trained uh, they understand about you know, power meters, power training, wattage, power to weight, all those sorts of things, watts per kilogram. Um, so as they come into the pro ranks, they already are so much more advanced in understanding of their bodies and the intricacies of professional sport than the previous generation. So I think it will just come down to motivation because physiology doesn't change. If you're a good athlete in terms of physiology, it's always with you. You can improve mm. it slightly. And the only way to then see it decline is either overtraining or lack of interest. So I think it would just come down to their motivation. Can they stay and, that motivated? I, I'm just saying, Scotty, that's why, look, the old farts, like Tommy Maloney, who's talking, but uh, joking. You and me, you and me as well, yeah. We've seen the youngsters come through in the past and get burnt out, and that's why the question's coming up. But they weren't handled correctly. The problem was not that they were so young, that they were worked too hard when they were so young. Now, 
they're monitored so closely and they know when to back them off. So they're still progressing quite quite well, but they don't burn them out. And that was the problem that happened years ago. Yeah. Okay, yeah, well, I've got race a, a lot less. They race a lot less, don't they? Because back then the season, right, okay, this year of course is is is, is unusual, but everybody races less than we used to back in the day. So the young guys that aren't going to possibly be burnt out now are also racing even less because they understand the data, they can see the fatigue. As soon as your power starts to drop during races, um, that you know, the, the coaches then can see that, well, you're not actually producing the power you were a month ago. You're starting to get tired. We need to back you off and we'll change the program for the rest of the season. So that's what happens now with the young guys. Back in the day, it was just keep flogging them, flogging them until they can do any sort of job at all to the end of the year. It's great that when you hear uh, the guys like Stuart O'Grady, Hank Vogels especially, Robbie McEwen, of the, what they used to do, they knew their body so well and they were amongst us and they were first pro or in the, our elite uh, uh, squads like with Heiko and, and, and Charlie. They would feign sickness because they knew they couldn't do that race, they couldn't do something because their body told them yeah. they're going to have a break. So they just were smart enough to say, no, I'm not doing it. I'm not well. You know, they come up with a reason not to do it, and that we get them through. Yeah, I've got a story like that. So um, so in my time, after the 1988 Olympic Games, so Dean Woods was our strongest rider. We had Brett Dutton, Wayne McCartney. They were the three older guys. They all moved on the following year, and then Steve McLeod and I were the two oldest riders in the next group of riders, and Steve was definitely the strongest rider by far. And I remember a time we were training – in Germany, we had a morning session of team pursuit efforts and Steve just tore us all apart. So we had a bunch of younger guys come through as well um, and Steve just totally ripped us all a new one. And then we came in the afternoon to do the afternoon session on the track and Steve walked in later just in casual clothing. And we said, Steve, what, what are you doing? He said, well, I, I told the coach that, um, you know, I was feeling a bit tired after the session this morning and he said, you probably should have the afternoon off. And we're sort of all looking at each other like, well, you completely smashed us in the morning. You're definitely the strongest. We're all struggling, but you get the, the afternoon off. So then he, he would then get freshen up the next day and just smash us another one. Um, <laughs> yeah, so we would all sort of keep going down and down and down. Um, and look, you know, Steve was just the, be the best rider, but he got that treatment that, you know, they believed him that he was tired, so they gave him time to freshen up. And I guess that's the, the smarts of guys like Robbie and co., to actually, you know, get ahead of the game and actually make sure they did get that time to freshen up. Well, I've got a story like that as well. I went for an 18K walk yesterday, woke up this morning and couldn't be stuffed. So it's about <laughs> listening to your body, you know. Don't have to burn yourself out. Hey, I've got a question uh, for both of you. I'll start with you, John. How does this season affect the riders' market in terms of price? So when you're looking to build a team, you're probably going to be less inclined to pay your two, three million bucks for these old veterans that have, you know, like your nibblies and all that. You'd be better off paying overs for a young guy like Scotty was saying that, you know, is well drilled, you know, is is professional, understands his body and developing them. Um it, it will have an effect, yeah, on the on the writer's market. John? Look, I, I don't reckon it, it will affect the old farts that you're talking about, like the nibblies and that, because they're still huge people in the sport, whether they're actually going to win another Grand Tour or not. They're, you know, the Italian teams love a, a nibbly because, you know, of who he is and, and so forth. Why do I think the ones that get affected are the middle group? Because the young everyone wants these young stars that are showing potential. They jump. They, they don't, their price doesn't drop down. But it's the there's a hundred riders out there right now not signed. They're the poor buggers that are gonna have to take sort of minimum wages to get uh, a deal. All of them are gonna have to take minimum with bonuses for going well. And that, that's gonna be very much the go uh, for the end of the season. Unfortunately, because of this whole compacted uh, COVID uh, uh, season and, and the sponsorship challenges a lot of these teams have had, plus with a couple of teams falling over. So it's made it very, very awkward. But I don't really think the big names will lose much. Uh, and the young stars won't. Oh, I, no, I reckon they will. I reckon they will. I reckon you are wrong. Well, we'll, see. That's, well that's, that's not why I'm here. I'm talking to to you know to some of the teams, uh, and, and it's the middle ones that they're they're now getting for the bottom price. I just don't think they're going to, particularly after COVID, they're going to really calculate their budgets and just say, well, you know, but it's not. I worth don't know that many. I don't know many. I don't know many of the riders you're talking about, senior riders who aren't already contracted, aren't on the second year or, uh, and with another year to go. I don't know many of them that are even chasing a contract. 
Now, mm. John, Dan, I reckon you're probably right in terms, like if we go into next year and it's still an interrupted um, season, which the way things are going in Europe, um, there's no change going into next year. You know, and it's, it's interesting in it, like everybody is so hopeful that 2021 is going to be okay. That it's almost like people put a date on it, 1st of January, things are going to be better next year. But all indications, um, all indicators show that, that nothing's going to change just yet. No. So I reckon that's when what you're saying really may come into play, that if we're going to have another truncated season, that's when we've, you know, we've got to think about the big dollars that are getting paid. The sponsors are going to be hurting even more so. And I think everyone's probably going to have to take a cut next time if, if it continues like it has this year. Mm. It's going to be interesting. Hey, uh, we we said in the, the title of the video, we've got a very special guest coming up soon, uh, Rory Sutherland. It's his last week of his career, so we're going to have plenty of great questions to ask him. Uh, before we get to that, John, do you want to kick off with your pitch for Mitchell and Wayne's? I certainly will. I certainly will. A beautiful Mitchelton winery, one of Australia's favourite wineries and a place of escape. Experience the history, the beauty and the serenity of the beautiful Goulburn Valley at your own pace. Looking over the vineyards and the iconic tower and staying at the new hotel. Relaxing by that magnificent pool you see there. Recharging in the day spa like those couple. Exploring the seasonal menu at the Mew Town together. But that's fine. It looks nice. And Jerry oh, does. Well, uh, I've been, of, running, I've of been running that picture for ages. I need to change I know. it. That's okay. Yeah. It's a Sorry, beautiful mate. spot. That's all right. <laughs> and um, you can uh, stop by the Probador, stop uh, touring in the cellars, and of course, tasting the signature wines. It has become the popular venue for weddings and major functions. And there's a happy couple and another happy couple. Well, I think they're happy. He's I can't see whether he's smiling. I reckon he is. That looks like he's about to draw some guns or something. <laughs> <laughs> like he's got a kilt I think, he, I think he's got a kilt on. Anyway. They're negotiating the prenup. Bring out you the look at it, me, up. punk. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and of course, there's the amazing uh, Aboriginal Art Gallery, which, as I said, is world class. And uh, as I mentioned, there, there it is. There, there it is again. I thought you were showing the other photo of the beautiful uh, Land Cruiser, with the uh, $10,000 Land Cruiser with the $1.3 million uh, paint job. Uh, and we saw, we've got that photo. There's one photo, uh, painting in there that was uh, just being valued at two million dollars. Yeah, know, I don't, I don't know if I, if I was Jerry, I'd sort of be keen to keep that on the down low because you know you don't want to create a heist. Okay, well, I, I was going there with, a, I was going there with a the trailer tomorrow. Actually, <laughs> yeah, well, that's what I mean. Imagine, well, if, imagine if that gets nicked. Guys, I just realised how long it's been since I've been on with you two because the, the Land Rover's up to 1.3 million. I think it was oh, yeah. 550 last time I was on. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, right. it's you've been a long... Well, you, well you, you, we keep asking you and you keep giving us the lemonade, as they say in the classic. The lemonade, yeah. 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 Uh, well, all right. Now it's time for a quick word from our great mates at Bike Exchange. Look at this bike. You think it's just a bike, right? But it's not. <clears throat> it's a bike. 374 people are looking at. This guy, this girl, them, all looking at it. People from here, there, and wherever this is. People that are looking for a bike. Or just a piece of it. Amateurs, semi-amateurs, and pro-amateurs. This guy wants this bike, but with this crank and these bars. This could be the perfect match, but not this one. This girl has a bike to sell, and thousands of people might purchase it. Eyes on Bikes help grow small businesses. His, hers, yours, and the latest data and insights help those businesses keep moving. We are the world's number one bike marketplace, with over 500,000 products and 900 brands, where buyers and sellers are brought together in a place where a bike is never just a bike. Bike Exchange, where the world buys, sells, learns, and rides. Thanks again to our great mates at Bike Exchange. Now, yeah, Rory it's Sutherland. like a good wine, isn't it? Like it, it just keeps getting better and better, like a very good Mitchelton wine. That is. Yeah, it's, it's a good ad. Um, now, Rory's on his way. Uh, he reckons he's technically uh, dyslexic, but um, I reckon he's going to be able to work out, and I can see he's in the studio now. Rory, how are you, mate? You've done it. 
You've worked Gentlemen. out how to click the link. <laughs> I figured the audio's out, working. Figured out technology uh, uh, in, the, in the tired state that I'm in somewhere in Spain. Who the hell knows where I am? <laughs> well, <it's good> to <laughs> great, see, great to see you, mate. Great to see you. Yeah, you're looking, nice you're to see you. You're well. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. After this race, it's a little bit grayer. You know, the beard's <laughs> getting a little bit longer. There's some dark rings under the eyes, but that's all, all part of the game, as we all know. Um, how, how are the emotions, mate? Uh, you're about to embark on the final week. Yeah, it's. Uh, I wouldn't say it's too emotional. I think. I think, you know, me personally, I got to the stage uh, this year where I think I'm very lucky to be able to choose when I retire and when enough is enough. You know, a lot of guys I think don't get that opportunity. It's kind of forced upon you. So in that respect, I kind of knew this was going to be the last, the last race. And, and to be blatantly honest, at some of these days, I'm like, thank God I don't have to do this anymore. <laughs> uh, and, that's, and that's really nice because that means you get to race the race the way you want to do it. And, you, and I like to, you know, it doesn't matter if it's raining or windy or whatever. I just take every day as it comes and uh, you know it's actually going to end. There is a, there's an end in sight. How's the uh, buzz in the group? Dan Martin's obviously in some pretty good form. Another impressive ride yesterday. Um, there must be a bit of buzz going into the final week with the uh, Israel Startup Nation boys. Yeah, definitely. You know, it's uh, <clears throat> it's something new for this team specifically. You know, obviously the team, the signings that are coming in the future, it's, it's still progressing to get to the higher level. Uh, but Dan, you know, is a good friend of mine as well. And, and we've kind of, uh, it was interesting before the Tour de France, the team decided that he was going to go to the tour, but he was going to try for stage wins and, and that kind of thing. And Dan, I had a chat with him before then, and we, we talked quite a lot. And I said, Dan, mate, like, this is a great opportunity for the Vuelta, you know? And he's like, really? And I'm like, yeah. I said, you can be flying at the Vuelta because you can use the tour you know, you don't have to completely bury yourself at the tour. You can go for, you can ride the Gruppetto a few days and things like that. And then for the Vuelta, you get your head switched on and you've got these kilometers in the legs, which, which a lot of guys don't have if you didn't do, do the tour. And I said, it's a great opportunity for him and maybe, maybe one of the only opportunities for him to get on the podium uh, of a grand tour. Um, so I'm glad he, he listened to me on that one because it's obviously working quite well. Uh, but yeah, the, the, the feeling in the group, we've got a really mixed group of, of experienced and inexperienced riders, uh, which actually is, is really good vibe because the older guys can, can help the younger guys get through their first grand tour, explain to them how it's working, really help them, uh, to develop more as, as riders. Uh, and yeah, we've only got six more days to, to hopefully get Dan, uh, up onto the podium. Scooter. Um, what's the like? What's the atmosphere back like in Israel? So, what sort of communication you're getting from you know from the authorities that uh, obviously that are in charge of the team? Because obviously there's a there's a whole market there that that's mm. just waiting for it to happen. Yeah, it's difficult on on the writer's point of view here because we don't. I think I think there's the language barrier that we don't understand. Obviously Hebrew as much as I'd like to say I do. I know nothing. Uh, so we don't kind of we can't see the the press and and what's coming out there it's not kind of translated for us i know there's been a big push for the team obviously uh, we have an israeli guy who's in this team uh omar who's doing his first grand tour and and there's never been an israeli in the welter before uh so that's kind of been the big the big project from the team from the word go uh so hopefully it'll generate like it has in Great Britain, uh, like it has in Australia by having national, basically like national teams, like a connection to a country or the UAE or Bahrain uh, to really help that next, uh, the next run of, of riders to make, make it a more, a, a bigger sport in the country. And obviously at the end of the day, get more people on bikes. Well, I know that the um, Astana team was a really good tool to combat the film Borat. So, oh, yeah. Um, yeah. It was it was a real positive effect. Uh, if he, <laughs> I thought they just reinforced the movie Borat. But anyway, we'll we'll just keep moving on that one. Advertising, yeah, look, space, yeah. advertising space on the Mankini was a bit of a problem. Though, that was the first team kit they were going to go still, with. But it's still, mate, it's still there in the peloton. I'm still well. Now we can't see people yelling on the side of the roads on climbs because they're all blocked off. But you see a few, you see a, f a few Mankinis out there every now and again. The bright green ones, and it's it's not always a pleasant sight, gentlemen. 
I'm dealing you know, with Bor- the one Borat wore <laughs> to, was actually Vinokurov's uh, night sleepwear, but I, I don't know if that's true. I don't know if it's true. But, yes, uh, <laughs> um, mate, Rory, it's great to catch up with you again. It's been a little while. But I just wanted to touch on your career. A lot of the, uh, Some of our listeners are all new to the sport. But you you come out of the Robobank uh, uh, Young Development Group and you were a pro with Robobank back in 2005. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you spent, I think it was six years in America. You were yep. with, with Help Net, 2007 to 2012. Yep. I'll go back and ask you about that uh, in a minute. And then you came back to Europe. You were with Saxo. A couple of years, then on to Movie Star, which Movie you had Star. a great, great, great uh, uh, time with Movie Star. Then UAE, and yeah. now it, 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 Israel. But that yeah. six years in the States, mm-hmm. how did you find that? It was amazing. You know, it was a really amazing experience for me at the time. I guess at the place I was at in my life then as well. Uh, and I really thrived on that environment. I think it was. I don't think I'd still be racing at, at 38 years old in the World Tour if I hadn't have had that kind of block there in the middle it kind of was a it's it's real racing but it's different than the slog day in day out of european life and and living um but i made so many good friends and and learned so many things there and i actually learned there i think one of the biggest things i learned with racing in the in the u.s is obviously you're a you know you're a you're in a smaller pond a bigger fish in a smaller pond where it's the other way around in europe so that my job there was to be the winner you know, I was there to try and win the races, to win the GC in races. And the good thing is that would never have happened in Europe. So what that taught me is, okay, so this is what a GC leader needs. You know, I know what I need. I know what I feel. I know what I need from my teammates. So I think in terms of development for me personally, that when I came back to Europe again, I know what the guy is feeling who I'm looking after in the race. I know what they need. You know, some people have different needs than others, but I think that really carved kind of uh, a job for me or one that I that I really love doing uh, when I'm here. And I think one that with the teams I've been on and the riders that I've looked after has been a, a pretty respectful role, you know. Scooter? Does that, does that lead um, – so I don't know if you've made the announcement or not, and apologies if, if, if you already have, but so what is the next step? What Does that oh, lead to a DS position? Or? I thought this was a, a job interview here. <laughs> mate, you no can worries. come on any time. Any time, mate. <laughs> it's a free. It's free though. It's not a very good job. Doesn't pay much. <laughs> Doesn't pay much, but hey, we'd love to have you, mate. Yeah. No, you know, it's uh, we're working on things at the moment. Um, you know, the I approach things a little differently than I guess the the standard professional. You know, I've been outside of Australia, even though being Australian, I've been I left Australia twenty years ago. Um, you know, I've my my wife's from the US. We've lived in Girona in Spain for the last eight years. The kids go to school there. The kids are super happy. And, uh, you know, the kids, even my seven-year-old daughter speaks fluently three languages. Um, you know, and that's something you can't get anywhere else. So firstly, when I, when I decided to retire, what do, what do you do? Your wife's from the States. I'm from Australia. Kids are happy. It's not about us. It's about the kids. Um, so we're, you know, first and foremost, we're going to stay in Europe. And then the other side is that I never, ever wanted to be a sport director. Mm-hmm. I never, I never wanted to be one, and I still don't want to be one. What, uh, what not, is that? Not that I don't <laughs> respect them, but I just spent, you know, when I look at my sons, my son's eleven years old. I've spent his entire life doing one hundred and ten to one hundred and fifty days away from home, mm. um, and my wife's been a single parent. Like, like Scott understands how it works. Dan, you've been away from your family, and and Ify, when you were racing as well, it's like you, you guys understand what the the mother of the household has to deal with uh basically being a single parent when when you're away and then when i'm home she's still a single parent because she has to look after me uh (laughs) but basically so i think it's not in my mind it's not fair on her to to keep that going i actually want to i want her to thrive a bit more and and have opportunities for herself um and i want to be there for the family so i've actually turned down i think three four sport director jobs uh already because it's just at this stage of my life is not what i want to do um but right now we're very i'm pretty close to to a job within this organization uh one that allows me to stay at home more and one that allows me to be effective in the in in what i'm what i would consider myself and what the team considers me to be good at uh which is basically dealing with with some of the younger riders teams based in girona really trying to fill the void between i guess what a sport director does and what the rider's reality is about what they're feeling and thinking 
um, and just try to you know close that gap to get a bit more of a cohesive group within a within a team. That's a it's a good point you've raised there, Roy. Do you think that there's a need within cycling teams that sort of bridge role between the riding group and management so that there's a collective voice amongst the riders and they're not having to voice concerns or opinions directly with management? Because depending on the team, you know, the managers might not take that advice or that um, feedback that well. And that's and that's one of the honestly, you know, I think when you speak to a lot of a lot of guys who have been active in the Peloton in the last ten years, like myself or what, what Matty Heyman was obviously till the end, is that three years ago cycling is completely different than what it is today. Uh, mm. the way it's raced in the Peloton, the age of riders that are winning grand tours and, and all these stages, it's it's a completely different uh, a different sport basically. Um, and that's not saying it's worse or better, it's just different. It's it's evolved. Uh, and then obviously with the pandemic, that's changed things a, a whole nother level as well. Um, so yeah, uh, personally, I think what's lacking now in a lot of the teams is exactly what you said, is that, is that there's a gap between the reality of what a sport director is used to doing to what actually is happening today in the peloton. Uh, and having somebody in the middle, and, and again, I use Matt Hamer as an example that he just he retired just as it was kind of within the changing uh, period, so I'm sure he's being very effective in the in the team that he's in now, to be able to to bridge the gap and to be able to actually have you know honest communication. Uh, the biggest problem you have there, and I'm sure all you guys understand and know this, and this is a problem that I had at UAE, is that <clears throat> it's very hard to change a mentality. It's very mm. hard to change something that someone's been doing for so many years. Not to tell them that's wrong, but just to say, hey, let's progress, let's let's move forward. We have to always move forward. And I think that's when you see the state of uh, Spanish cycling and Italian cycling and honestly French cycling is that they're still stuck. They're still stuck. Uh, uh, they're kind of behind the eight ball of the old mentality that's there. They try to change a few little things, but they'll never go all in to, to do a proper, proper cleanup and a proper change. Um, and UAE was like that. They asked me to help them with certain things to bridge the gap. I expressed my ideas and, and they decided that those ideas were not their ideas uh, and they didn't want to do that. And that's okay. That's, that's their prerogative. But don't bloody ask me that. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, but the big, big difference is that here on this team, uh, on Israel Startup Nation, being a new team uh, from a new country in cycling, uh, it really is. And, and the people involved who have been in cycling before, but some haven't been, they're very open-minded. So they're very open-minded to change. And that's, honestly, I was considering retiring last year. And when I had a, a conversation with Chell Karlstrom, the general manager here last year, I was like, I could feel that he valued my opinion. And that mm. was, you know, that was huge for me. It's not about what the money was. It was about that you're being valued, that if somebody asks you that your opinion, they actually want to, to talk about it. It's not just straight away, no, we're not doing this. It's like, let's, let's talk about it and, and work together. Scotty? Well, it's, it's interesting. So a lot of people may not understand that, you know, you wrote for the UAE team and they may think that that's a certain organisation, but that's an old school Italian yeah. management team that then took yeah. over the UAE sponsorship, isn't it? And Mobistar, yeah. very similar. It's one of the oldest teams in the peloton. So both those teams are, are very much sort of old school mentality. Yeah. Which is but Mobistar, yeah. interesting enough, you know, I'm still phenomenal friends with, with, I had so much fun in that team. It was such a great organisation. I have a lot of respect for them. But I think if you even look at, uh, you know, 2019 to 2020 with those guys, you can really have a look at the, you just need to look at the roster of the team and the age. They've gone through a transition or they're in the middle of a transition of the, the Valverdes, Nairo moves on. Uh, yeah, Alejandro is coming to the end of his career. Some of the statesmen of the team are coming, you know, they're in their mid thirties or, or closer to my age as well is that there's a transition and there's a huge run of, of new riders that are coming through and that transition's taking, you know, it's, it's changed and it takes time to develop. But I think they've realised that and they're starting to work on, <clears throat> on, I guess, evolving within the sport and coming out of that old kind of mentality. If it he... was great, to actually, uh, uh, Rory, to, listen, to hear you talk about this role that you're going to take on because Dan and I were having an in-depth uh, today on exactly uh, mm. uh, what we believe is needed in in, in, in a few teams. Uh, and the, the role we'll talk about is the role you were saying you were doing. Yeah. So uh, we think it's fantastic. Great, great, great idea, mate. Mm. Well, ju just for the listeners, so 
explain what the old school mentality is because some of them that aren't on the inner sanctum they they might not understand yeah i, th- I think the what you, when you consider the old mentality is that that these days things in cycling it's the big emphasis is emphasis is on uh, nutrition, aerodynamics, and uh, and knowledge of the race. Um, you know, technical technological advances. Um, you look at some of the biggest teams, and, and I think Ineos has been been such a. They've done such a good job at pushing world cycling. They've they've made a huge change in it to to, to change the 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 old ideals but it's like anything guys it's like if you have a if you have an iphone from 10 years ago it's completely different than what it is now you know you you, the amount of storage you have on it or how good the camera is and if you don't evolve with it and so when when we're talking about the old cycling we're not going back to the doping years we're not we're not talking about any of that we're just talking about the pure mentality of the sport directors are like, oh, well, I trained for seven hours a day, so you need to do the same thing. You need to do all these big base miles, but it doesn't work that way because the racing has changed. So there's a lot of wonderful things. And, you know, I keep using the examples of, of the Spanish, the French and the, the Italians because it's the historical base of cycling. Uh, and they're very difficult. They're wonderful people, but they're very difficult to, to look outside the box and try new things because it's it's just ingrained that that's what we do mm. uh and that's kind of what you get with you know like scott mentioned uae is basically uh came from the lamprey team with uh Cerrone. and you know i remember talking to Cerrone there who was world champion i think in 1982 uh and he said yeah aerodynamics are nothing you guys just have to try harder and i was <laughs> like yeah you know you know <laughs> Actually, actually, that's not quite right anymore. Uh, well, so, yeah. We've it's got a comment right, but... from uh, Diane Hannon says, I'm interested in the comment RE old school mindset in UAE, yet they had one of the youngest winners ever in the Tour de France. Yes. Now, what is what is the best catalyst for change in the world? Is failure, I think. So when mm. you, specifically in professional sport, when do you get change in an organization is when you fail. You fail and everyone goes, well, shit. This doesn't work. So we yeah. need to do something different or now we're behind. So how do we get back in front? And you've seen it from many teams. You've seen it from, uh, you know, from, from the first years of Sky and they were like, okay, this didn't work. So how do we, how do we evolve and, and move up, keep moving forward? Uh, and everyone else stays in the same, I guess, keeps doing the same thing. Uh, and UAE was like that to begin with. To begin with. And every year they've improved a lot of things. Um, you know, from, from the year that the first year I was there to the second year was a huge change. They've changed a lot of things within the organization. They've done a great job at a lot of it. Luckily they have the money to be able to afford to do certain things. Um, the youngest, you know, the youngest winner of the, the Tour de France and the, definitely the modern era. I remember Tade Pogaka, who I'm really good friends with. Uh, and I remember him, he came to one of the training camps with us there in Sicily and the kid's just phenomenal. Like there's, I think you could put him on a on an old steel bike with wooden wheels, and he'd still win. Like really, the aerodynamics and everything makes sense. Cerrone's old jersey, put him in old Cerrone's old Basically, bike. You could, you could. Yeah. He's he's phenomenal. But you know, they've they've improved a lot of things there, which is which is fantastic. They've evolved, they've moved forward. Uh, but yeah, a top, the best riders with the most talent still can win in a lot of in not the best environments. Um, yeah. yeah. So it's more developing the rest of the crew if the environment's right um, as a collective. Do you think one of the biggest issues or, or the way forward is to involve riders more as shareholders, particularly when it comes to like old school, there's a race plan, director gets up in a bus and he goes, right, hey, guys, this is what we're going to do. Bang, 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 these are your jobs. And mm. it very much feels like you're at high school again. Whereas in the modern cycling, if you can give riders buy-in to the yeah. – race tactics and also chemistry chemistry yeah. should be a key focus uh there was an amazing story i heard from maddie keenan um a couple of days ago and it was from the giro and he said uh he did an interview with luke roberts mm-hmm. and uh he noticed that jai hindley on the training camp two weeks before the uh, two months before the giro was very relaxed playing ping pong with the boys and you know having a laugh and whatever then when they got to the giro he was very stiff very nervous mm. the first three or four days 
he said to him on the sprint stage, he said, right, Ajay, um, your job tomorrow is one thing. And he goes, oh, you know, what do you want me to do? You know, help with the lead out or whatever. He goes, no, no, no. I want you to go to breakfast. I want you to rip the piss out of one of your teammates. He goes, what? He goes, just go to breakfast, rip the piss out of one of your teammates. That is your number one job for the day. Mm. And he went to breakfast and real awkward, tried to rip the piss. Everyone started laughing. He started laughing. From that day forward, he was a different bike rider. He wasn't yeah. stressed. He was relaxed. And it's so much about understanding that every rider is different. Yeah. Every rider works differently. So what works for a Pogachar might not work for you know his teammates. And yeah, you've yeah. got to adapt and have a, a, a goal of building chemistry, mm. building respect, giving riders buy-in. Do you think that's mm. sort of some of the things that need to be to progress forward? I think it's a it's a huge thing, and I think that's why I'm really happy in the organisation I am here is because it is very progressive. It's open minded. It's progressive. So so a, a quick rundown of what we did. You know, this team did the Tour de France, their first Tour de France. Uh, huge amount of stress, obviously, for the team. Huge amount of media. Went most of it went horribly wrong. Uh, partly, I think, because of the the group of riders that were there collectively. Uh, not because they're bad riders or not good people. It's just if a couple guys are not on a, on a good time or don't actually really want to be there, then it changes the whole dynamic of the group. And that's a huge, huge problem. Uh, mm. What we did when we came here, uh, so two days before the Vuelta, I said to the, to the sport director, I'm like, well, first I'd spoken to him the week before and I said, let's all have a sit down. You know, So there's, there's basically four sport directors here uh, one of them's Zach Dempster, who everyone knows well. Um, and we all sat down and I sat, I got Dan Martin in on the meeting and we sat down and we just, we just laid it on the table. And I was like, you know, us as Australians, we do that. Europeans don't, they hold things back. They don't, they don't, it's not that they're not truthful. It's just, they don't like conflict a lot of them. Um, whereas we like constructive criticism and we like to, if there's an issue as Australians, we like to sit down on the table and like, let's bloody deal with it. Like, why, mm. why not just deal with it? And we'll just, and then we move on and we'll go to a new place. So we had to sit down and like I said, luckily with this organization, as opposed to the previous, for me anyway, is that being valued and your opinion being valued and people realizing that you're not after their job, you're not trying to, you're all striving for a common goal. And that was the first thing I, I always said to the, I said in this meeting, I was like to the director, I'm like, guys, I had an offer to be a director. I said, no, I don't want to do it. I'm not here for your job. I'm not saying you can't do your job. Let's find a way to work to work together in a better way. We have Dan Martin right here. Ask him what he needs. If mm. Dan doesn't want to hear who's attacked in the last 2K on a climb, he's there. He has instincts. He's, he's, a, he's an amazing athlete. He knows what he's doing. So this is the information we need in the race. This is the feeling we need in the group. And we need to stay, you know, one of the big things and my big job here <clears throat> is that physically, one, because of my age and two, because after I broke my leg last December, I'm not the rider I was before. But one of the big things that I was brought to this race for was not 100% in the race situation. It's everything externally as well. So it's when you get into the bus. It's when you are at the dinner mm -hmm. table. It's to really have that vibe of the riders so that everyone, even though we're suffering and we're having hard moments together, everybody is suffering together. And exactly what you said, Dan, of like having a joke, everyone having a laugh, uh, laughing at yourself and really that, that connection of, of the staff and the riders coming together. And that's, I think, one of the big reasons it's working so well here. Um, one other thing that has always amazed me with cycling, right, is in any other sport, all right, say if it's NBA, say the team don't go too well, sack the coach. Mm. Or if it's AFL, sack the coach. If yeah. a team at the Tour de France don't perform, people aren't going, hey, get rid of the DS, you know. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. what what it sort of says is like the evolution for the role as a DS is you're a manager of people. Not as you obviously you need tactics and all that sort of stuff, but you are a person manager more than anything, and the ability to understand the psychology of the sport. Mm. You know, you look at a Dave Brailsford, right? He he's given people the the reasons why he's so good is because he's had a passion for sports psychology from the start. Yeah, yeah he yeah. under he, he gets in into the mindset of it, and I think that you know, as you've found, if you if you're in a team that is very much stuck in their old ways. 
um, there, there might be some red flags, particularly if it's about the evolution and the potential to grow. So based on everything that you said, you must be pretty excited for next year when you get the likes of a Chris Froome into the team, not just for, you know, say if he doesn't win the tour or whatever, but mm. that effect that he's going to have on the development of those younger guys coming through must be huge. And I think that's one of the big steps why Sylvan Adams, the owner, decided to hire Chris. You know, there's a risk involved uh, with his return and his age, obviously. Uh, but what I think he brings to the table in terms of the experience and the way that people look up to him for what he's what he's achieved and definitely the kind of person that he is because he is a very down-to-earth. He's, he's not this big – he doesn't put himself across as a superstar. Like he wants to have a conversation with you, he wants to have a laugh. He, he, he doesn't consider himself above anybody else. Um, and I think that's going to make a huge impact – one on the team and two on the the marketing marketability of the team in Israel to really kind of tick the boxes of what Sylvan Adams is trying to do, which is develop a sport in a country uh, and to you know use get rid of the politics and and use sport to build the bridges. That's his whole his whole aim. So you know I think we're definitely gonna going to it's exciting for me, especially with the guys that I see that they've hired and. And going back, Dan, to, to what you were saying about the psychology of it, one of the things in the in the they do interviews with the writers that they're going to hire, and if they don't jive with the idea of where the team's going and open mindedness and 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 a positive, it, it, it's not just based on what numbers you can produce. It's you know, and that's kind of an old that's a an Ineos style of doing things, of like this guy does six watts per kilo for blah 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 blah. It's like yeah, but he he's not a good teammate or he's not the best mm. person and he's, you know, a bit of an individual. Whereas here it's like, okay, this guy's physically has the ability, but at the same time, who is he as a person? Can yep. he fit into the group? Can we, because you guys know if, if you, the success of, of Mitchell and Scott, a lot of it is because of that group, that bond between the riders, mm. um, that they, they push each other and they, and they, they go into, they go into war every day to die for each other. And, and a lot of teams, you don't see that. And the teams that do get that together, that's where you're successful. Scooter? Um, I remember uh, a rider at the World Championship, well, part of the, the team going to the World Championships um, years ago, that came up with a number one day. We started training. We're in Germany. And he said it's, I you know, can't remember exactly the number. He said, oh, it's 127 days. And I'm like, oh, what, till the World Championships? He said, no, no, until we go home. Oh, Oh. Yeah. So he's counting that down. That's not a very good for the group, is it? No, no. And, and, and that, was, that was quite cancerous between the group mm. straight away. Like it was this negative approach to he doesn't really want to be there. We've got the world championships yeah. coming up on the track. But he's counting to when he gets to go on the plane to go home again. So, you know, and a lot of the, the teams back then were quite young and the, I guess the leadership of the team wasn't mm. there. We didn't have an older statesman to come in and say, whoa, whoa, hey, buddy, pull your head in. You can yeah. pick whatever you want, but don't contaminate the rest of the mindset of, of this squad. Um, mm. and, and he wasn't riding in the team pursuit. He was doing the individual pursuit, whereas we were as a group trying to, you know, collectively come together. Um, and that was quite a negative thing to have. Um, and that's exactly, honestly, that's exactly what I'm trying to stay away from in this organisation. And that's what we were doing from, from day one. Day one here, even with all the younger and experienced riders, I've been like, every day we sit down, you know, just simple little things like the road, the road book. So for the whole race being as long as it is, it's like, it's thick. It's an, mm. you know, it's an encyclopedia. <laughs> I said to the guys, I'm like, stop, don't look at the last week. Just look just every day. We take it a day at a time. You're going to have a good day. You're going to have a crap day. But we take it a day at a time. We move forward slowly. And my one of my roles here is to, is to stop that negativity from festering and getting worse because once it's contagious, you know, negativity is very contagious. And once people go down that rabbit hole and get started, it just mm. keeps going, keeps going. And that's in this team. This is that's what happened in the tour is that they had a couple guys who were not having a good time, which is fair enough, the way they're feeling after crashes and everything, but no one stopped them from keeping on going down and then you drag everyone with you. Is that, is that been even harder in 2020 to combat that negative sort of mindset because a lot of riders and staff have been under so much stress uh, this year more than ever? Mm, I, think, I think it's very underestimated what the pandemic, especially in Europe, has done to... A lot of people, you know, when you take advantage, you take, you think about the 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 riders based in Italy, France, and uh, and Spain and Andorra, is that we were literally indoors for seven weeks, 
you know, and what that does to somebody mentally is huge. You know, you, you can't see it. The staff then, they're doing the same thing. And then when they can finally go to work, you know, we have some staff who have basically been on the road for three and a half months. Yeah. So there, it's just, you know, the, the stress levels of an entire season, which is normally, you know, this long, it's the same stress, but it's put into this small box that mm. everything happens in these, in these three month period. We've had three grand tours overlapping. We've had classics, we've had everything. And the stress levels are, are huge, I think, for everybody. And also a thing that needs to be factored in when teams do their reviews at the end of the season and they're looking at the numbers and all this sort of stuff, they've also got to factor in every rider, as we said earlier, is different. Some of these guys that were in lockdown, you've got to also factor in the ones that are in lockdown by themselves, yeah. the ones that are in lockdown with their part with partners, because the ones particularly that were in lockdown by themselves, I think there's some some scarring that's happened, particularly well, some of the guys in, in Girona. That look at, in there for look at Bewley. Bewley's already messed up in the head and now look at him now. He's even worse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, exactly. I it, mate, I, I, I had a semi-rough time, but I have a, a house with a backyard. Uh, so we had, you know, a place to go outside. I, I had a, you know, at that stage, my kids were, were six and, and ten years old. We had schooling every day that was happening online with them. We have access to computers and stuff like that. We have, we're lucky enough to have that stuff in the house. Uh, and we've got a, you know, I have a, an injury that I was coming back from so we can train. So we're on the ergo every day. You know, that we have a plan. I can't even imagine what people went through who were, you know, who were by themselves in an apartment. And not, not just professional athletes, but, uh, but the general public. We've got a comment. From Sam Bewley. Rory can be intelligent. Good chat, fellas. And then he wrote, love you. <laughs> talking, talking, of, talking about somebody that's uh, obviously still sitting in a house by himself. <laughs> yeah. um, we've got a few other comments. Tom says, it's fantastic that so many Aussies are at the forefront of team development and evolving of culture. Makes me so proud. Thank you so much for the thought-provoking commentary, Rory. Love it. And we've got another comment from Sam again. She says, does Rory have an opinion on the experienced riders implementing protests and speaking up for the peloton? TV work for Rory. Seems very comfortable in front of the camera and articulate. Ooh. Getting a lot Samantha, of love, mate. Samantha, I'm married, Samantha. So... <laughs> <laughs> but call me, you know. <laughs> you know um, yeah. What did you think of the protest? I think it was done in a wrong way, to be honest. Uh, yep. Which I think is a spur of the moment emotional thing. But uh, I think the... I've had a lot of chats about this in the last few days um, because me being, a, I guess, one of the, the elders in the peloton and one that's first language is in English and I don't obviously have a problem in, in speaking my mind or my opinion, hopefully in a, in a good constructive way. Uh, you know, the protest was, was valid. It just wasn't maybe done in the right way. Uh, I wasn't necessarily part of that decision. You know, you kind of have to go with the flow in some parts of it. But at the same time, the the peloton does not have confidence in the the CPA, which is which is our union. We haven't had it for a long time, so there's no unity there. And that's mm. a lot of them are working very hard on things. But we, as as the riders, keep getting told that we're being represented by this organisation that we don't we don't agree with and we didn't choose. You know, yeah. we, if we didn't choose. Uh, who's in charge and we weren't allowed to choose then stuff starts to go wrong when the confidence isn't there then then people kind of take uh, try to do things for themselves um, so the protest I think was very valid but I think it could have been a bit more constructive but maybe that's a, a generator for some continued slow change as well um, Rory um, oh, sorry Dan um, you are. I see the possibility of an opportunity here because in terms of, you know, who has the power in the sport, the UCI would like to have it. They've yeah. never had the power. It's ASO that have the broadcast rights to the Tour de France. They have the most money, the most revenue. They have the most power. Mm -hmm. It was a big battle between the UCI and the ASO a couple of years back. ASO wasn't really much of a battle for them because they just no. continued to win that battle. RCS, mm -hmm. the Giro d'Italia organisers, they've jumped on board. They've got a bit of a tyrant at the top of uh, their organisation oh, as Don't well. get me started on that bloke. Oh, no, I just want to throw that in just for you, Dan. Yeah. But, um, but I, I feel that what happened, what's happened this year is that some of that absolute power has become a little bit more vulnerable in terms mm. of the race organisation because, you know what, if the, if the race can't go ahead, 
the race organisation for whatever that event is has no power whatsoever, yeah. mm. is there now an opportunity perhaps for the riders to actually get a proper union organised and actually take some of this power back and, and have control from the teams and the riders' perspective? I think a lot of it's in process at the moment. <clears throat> There's There might be some stuff, you know, I've heard little whispers here and there and there might be some stuff coming out today about that. Uh, but we have been pushing within the riders' organisation uh, more and more for the one one vote per rider, which is what it bloody should have been since the beginning. Uh, not these like package votes because of how many people. One guy in France who's in charge of yeah, things, who no one voted crap. in there. He can he can vote for a thousand French professionals, whereas Australia yep. ha- we have three votes. You know, like doesn't make it. It's not correct, and that's the big thing the riders are pushing, and that will be a gen- you know that'll be a catalyst for change. You know, the, the difficult thing is the guys that are pushing it are the guys in the in their last years of racing. And at some point, like Adam Hansen, I've spoken to him about it, and he's like, bloody hell, guys. Like, I've been trying this for years and years and years. And he goes, I'm just tired. He goes, I'm tired of fighting things. At the end of the day, some of the younger guys don't get it and they don't give a shit. They will in the future, but they really don't care right now because they just want to race their bikes and win. Um, so I think I think it is a good moment. And I think something that... that you know, there was a document that, that we as the writers put out yesterday, which was not from the CPA. It was from, from us, from the writers, written by the writers. Uh, and that uh, was saying how good the, org- the race organisation here is in the Vuelta, comparatively to how the ASO handled things in the Tour de France and other races, um, how the Giro d'Italia was run, that it was a complete debacle. So what the organisation here has done, I think, is really listened to, to the, the scientific data uh, regarding the pandemic. We've never, we as the writers, we've commented this a lot. We've never seen such a safe race for us, actually dedicated at us. And why is it safer than normal? It's because they have to, otherwise the race won't happen. So they've had their hand forced. But like we had one rider who had a, he had a temperature one night. He had a fever after the race. Uh, and so everyone basically shits themselves, of course. That's how it works now. Um, mm. The very next morning at 7 a.m., the organization, the people from the, I guess, that run the lab, who, which is a, a moving lab, they have a massive truck and it goes to every single day. And they're at the start, they're at the finishes, they're everywhere. Um, and they, the lab, they can, they can process it all right there and then. They turned up at the hotel, they did a rapid test on him, negative. Then they did another test at the same time. They took it away to the lab to do it properly. Uh, also negative and then they said right because you guys were all involved with him what we need to do is instead of wait for the rest day we want to test the entire staff and riders so that's another 30 people so yesterday morning before the stage we had to go 10 minutes earlier boom into the lab uh, into the into a, a big white tent everyone got tested again and three hours later all the results are back and they're all negative so this this organization and and even on the climbs like the climbs it's blocked. Like you can't go up there as a fan. Uh, mm. They're actually taking it seriously. Whereas, to be honest, you look at the you look at the ASO and look at Leon, the stage into Leon, it was a bloody joke. Like oh, it, it was like people, nothing had ever. Happened. No mask and flashing brown eyes. No, no, exactly. And and the same with the Giro. The Giro was a complete and utter joke. And it's and it's money driven, of course, yeah. like bloody always. Uh, yeah. but they've done a really, we have to, and we, I've, I said this within the group of riders, uh, you know, we have a representative from every single team and I said it to them. I'm like, guys, we need to be, we can always go at the organizations and, and have a go at them for doing things wrong, but we need to, we need to be, be proactive and positive at the same time for when they do things right. Yeah. Uh, and we've been doing a big push on that in this race and it's been, it's been phenomenal. So I think there is a lot of change coming from that, and like I said, there's 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 there is a shift of power in you know in process, shall we say? Well, what about if you involve the team management as well for this collective voice? Because I mean, they've got their own battles that they're trying to be coming together with Valon and all these sort of things. It sort of needs to be like a, a, a just a real quality unit start afresh because if you keep having these battles back and forth with the CPA, as you know, it's just not going to get anywhere. And if the younger riders particularly go, shit, hang on, my whole team uh, part of this union or, you know, there's there's going to be a lot more power because, as you said, ASO, yeah, they've got power, but what is their product? It's teams yeah. racing each other across their race route. So if they're not racing, there's no money. Basically. Exactly. But at the end of the day, we get forced. Uh, I think there's too many steps as in 
if the if the head of the France team says I don't care, you guys are racing or you're not getting paid, then you have to go race. You you yeah. can't do it. We had guys, we had a couple of guys the other day when we did the small protest at the start. And the Spanish guy's like, oh, let's just race, guys. You know, let's race. I want to be on TV. You know, this is, let's, I don't want to mm. deal with this kind of stuff. It's like, dude, if you want to get there, then we, to create change, we need to create some sort of, you know, movement within, the, within what we're doing. Um, but I do well, that's why you've got to start the chant then, like, scab, scab, scab. <laughs> <laughs> that stuff um, I stay away from. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> um, Matt Brandell has put in a comment. This is a good one. He said, Rory's so right, and what he says chimes in exactly with my experiences at Movie Star. From day one, someone else in the team, far more established than me, was after my job. Bloody nightmare. In any case, Israel are extremely lucky to have Rory on board. I was no, actually right. after. I was the one after his job. That's the problem. <laughs> 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 no. But um, I was going to say, uh, you're, you're spot on there, Rory, because it looks like that next year things aren't going to change too much as far as this pandemic is concerned in no. Europe. There's not going to be a vaccine. So the racing could well go ahead, but it'll only go ahead if it's like the Vuelta, if it's, yeah. you know, run without crowds so that it's safe and it's a TV, it's it's for people to watch on TV so the sport can be seen globally yeah. but not to attract people because attracting people is what's causing the issue. Yeah. You can't mm. tell me that France – especially to it, but in Italy as well, that people were coming around and going back. There were no masks on people. They were nah. then going and spreading it all around their, their country. It's just yeah, an yeah. absolutely ridiculous nightmare. And that's where the world, like I said, the world has done such a good job, mate. Like, to be honest, you, you have to be, you have to say how well organised it's been and, and, and how good a job they've done. And we know that it's because of money, you know, but that's, if it's because of money, but it's in our benefit, that's fantastic. And if uh, you know, we have a we have a platform to be able to do our sport, and the guys that don't have a job can can try and perform. Uh, and that's you know, it, it's it's a different way of cycling next year. The Belgians think that it, that nothing ever was really wrong, so they just kept doing all the races. Now Belgium is the worst country in Europe. Uh, but in Spain, you know, it's been implemented from the from the word go that everyone wears a mask at all times when you leave your house or into a shop or anything. Mate, I, I was in Liège. I was in, oh, well, we were staying in Holland in Maastricht and I had to, I forgot my phone charger. So I put my mask on, walked down the street to the shop and not one person wore a mask. Mm. And it was like, and now they're in the shit as well. So yeah. no one knows what's really going on. But, but in terms of safety, it's, uh, you know, I think what they're doing here is a, is a great example to be able to, you know, put forward for, for next year. Mate, um, getting back to your career, uh, what do you think has been the keys to having longevity in the sport? Change. Changing, changing where you are, changing environments, uh, changing race schedules. Me, luckily, luckily and, and unluckily from the situations I've had in my career, I ended up in, in the United States. Uh, but that, I guess, got me the longevity uh, within the sport. Uh, because it was different perspective. It's like doing the same job. If you're doing the same job every year and you've done, you know, uh, I was talking to Dan Martin and he's, what, a couple of years younger than me, but not that much. And he's done 13 Liège Bass and Liège's. Mm. And I'm like, do you want to do something different? He goes, yeah, I'm kind of sick of Liège. I'm like, you, you, you're, probably, you're probably quite right there. That's quite <laughs> a lot of them. You've won it before. So how do you get motivated for the same thing every single year? So I think constant change, you know, uh, stick with an organization for a while, but you know, I'm, I'm lucky enough in, in my, I think one of the big things for an Australian and where some of the guys that are in, you know, in an Australian team like Mitchell and Scott or Ineos, these purely English speaking teams, uh, they don't get a different perspective on, on, on life. Um, there's tons of the guys, you know, and I'm not just using the Mitchell guys, but I'm using that as an example because, a lot of them are Australians, but none of them speak a word of Spanish and they've lived mm. in Spain for, for five years. I went to Mobistar where no one spoke English. Now I speak Spanish. You know, I went to Rabobank when there was on the under-23 team and there was 19, 19 Dutch and Belgians and I was the only native English speaker. I learned Dutch. Uh, so now I know, you know, I've come out with languages as well. So it's all those, those kind of experiences that, that keep you going and keep you moving. Scooter. I imagine I imagine you speak American too. 
Oh, a little bit. I try try not to. <laughs> depends what happens. Depends what happens tomorrow in the election, eh? Well, yeah, um, it's going to be a big challenge. But is that so? I, I don't know the backstory, but so did you when you were based in the states? Is that where you met your wife? Yeah, no, I met her over there, and uh, she was yeah. uh, she was lucky enough to find me come rolling in. She was actually <laughs> she was actually the one the one girl that I met there that you know when I said that I was Australian, she didn't give a shit, you know. She was all the really? other. Like, oh, you're an Aussie. I love you. Yeah, oh, they go nuts. Yeah, and they get you to like, say, speak sentences and yeah, yeah you like a, throw a shrimp on the barbie. I'm like, yeah, yeah. You don't actually use that word. So uh, <laughs> I had no, someone tell was, me it was a long drive. Said you're from Australia. So, oh, gee, that's a long drive. I'm like, well, yeah, it would be if it was possible. But I had I had my wife's uh, her grandmother when I first spoke to her. She goes, ah, oh, your accent. I'm like, yeah, yeah. yeah. She goes, what? Are, where on the east coast of the US are you from? I'm like <laughs> West Coast. I'm on the East yeah. Coast, but the East Coast of a different part of a different continent. Uh, um, where were you based? Is, where were you based in the states? Uh, I was in California for a bit, in Southern California, and then uh, we bought a house in Colorado. So we were okay. there for for a good couple of years. Yeah, Bo- was it Boulder? Yeah, Boulder. Yeah. All right. No, only, so sorry, Dan. The only reason I asked that is because um, I've got a connection to Boulder, as Johnny knows. Um, I actually spent some time what's, in jail. What's her name? What's her name? No, 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 no. I spent some time in jail. Um, so it's right. my claim to fame of being in Colorado. Oh, just throw yeah. that little chestnut out. <laughs> no one knew that hey, one. Completely innocent, mate. Don't worry. Right, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Like He's never been back. Shawshank Prison. Everyone was innocent. Yeah. Same as me. All right. Hey, is uh, is your wife concerned about what's going on in the states at the moment? Because I'm, you know, I'm, I'm looking at news dot com, and it's like riots pending, and you know, after the election, either either way, it's going to be chaos. I'm not allowed to speak about it. I've been okay. told when I mention anything I see in the news, she goes, "I don't want to talk about it. Don't talk to me." About okay. It. And I'm like, okay, hey, yeah. let's. Yeah. All right. Well, flipping it to something more positive. Um, what what are you most what are you most proud of in your looking back at your career, mate? Other people winning, uh, you know, and that's that was one thing that was really interesting with me with uh, with being on Movistar and being on 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 Tinkoff, uh, Saxo Tinkoff and Tinkoff Saxo is when I was riding there with Contador, is being a part of a team and, and doing a job and, and feeling like you've you've participated and and helped the leader to get to that point to to win. And I had you know the feelings I had on Movistar when we won the Vuelta and uh, like. The biggest ones are any any race that Valverde won that I was there, and that I could that I contributed to, which I believe was all of them. Uh, he that really gave me an amazing feeling, um, and I'm super proud of what that was. And the interesting thing was, then I won a race myself in in the Vuelta Rioja, and I didn't get the same feeling. I hmm. uh, I I was happy, but I wasn't as happy as I was when somebody else won. Well, that's a sign that you're a bloody good bloke, isn't it? Maybe. <laughs> a lot is of it? people tell me I'm not. <laughs> no, but isn't that interesting? Because I, like, I, I think I told you guys during the, the, the Giro, um, the first job I had, mate, was as a DS for the Drap Pack team. Oh, yeah, and, that's right. And, and in the couple of months, you know, after signing on, that was say, in our Aussie summer, it's end of spring into to summer, the first big race we had the following year was the national championships and we planned and programmed and, and focused on getting Darren Lapthorne and um, uh, um, McLaughlin, actually, was the other one mm-hmm. that we were trying to get to win the national championships. And Darren Lapthorne ended up winning the nationals, which I remember pulling out. So I stopped the car a lap early. I didn't bother following the last lap because he was, we, we couldn't get up to the front. They wouldn't yeah. let us through. So we stopped because I just wanted to be there and watch him come across the line. And I was overwhelmed. I yeah. had feelings that I wasn't ready for because I'd spent my life being you know, a selfish, focused athlete, trying sure. to get the best out of myself. But to actually be a part of helping someone or you know, small role that I had to see him win a national championship, it was really interesting, the feelings it's, that were going yeah, through. Yeah, it's an amazing emotional it, – it's something that you don't expect. Like, yeah. you know, and Dan Martin won the third stage here in the Volta. How many months ago that was? I don't know. Been, it feels like I've been here forever. Uh, and I remember, you know, he, he won, but then he's rushed off to podium and then he has to do doping control and then he has to do media and everything. So he comes back to the, to the hotel later and I heard him come in to the, he was in the room next door to me. And, you know, so I knew he got back to the room and I went and knocked on the door and he opened the door and, and we both started crying. And we were both like, mm. what the wow, fuck awesome. is going on here? And I was like, yeah. you, you know, and we're not, we're not emotional, huggy people with each other. 
you know, and uh, we gave each other a hug and I was like started to tear up and I'm like, what the hell is wrong with this kid? You know, yeah. Uh, yeah. You know but like after the, after the finish, I knew that he didn't have his phone with him. So I, ca- I called his wife on the way back to, to the hotel. And so I'm chatting with his wife and we're, we're like getting emotional together and everything and all excited because he knew how much it means to him. And that's, that's one of the amazing things of this sport that we can, you know, we, we can be part of something like that. It's all those tough days, isn't it? It's the mm. days in the rain, the cold, the heat, the crashes, the break, like broken leg, all these yeah. things, all those little difficult things add up to the emotion that gets poured out when those sorts but, of But look at, look at how many podium situations you've had this year where the people are crying, the riders are crying. Yeah. And I yeah. think that's a big part of the pandemic and the, these, ex, these stresses that are underneath us. It's the yeah. emotions finally coming out. That people are like, mate, we've just been through this experience, this experience, and that's what we get there. But hey, guys, I actually have to go because I've got this writing thing I got to do. Uh, <laughs> oh, mate, it's it's been one of the best chats we've had on the detour, hands Fantastic. down, mate. Thank you, so been absolutely yeah. unbelievable. So yeah. we've got to, We've got to get you on again. Yeah, and remember, mate, I know your career is almost over, but there's always time to ride one more Bay Crits. Oh, no, never, uh, never again. I loved the, the chat was I, going I so love good. It. I loved it, and I really, it was a great part of my life to be able to come and do those things, and it was it, that did something special for you as a rider in terms of what you were, if I was doing the, the national championships, if I did the bake crits before, I knew I was going to be way better than if I didn't do it because it just gave me that you extra go. that extra thing. But, uh, but uh, I won't be back. <laughs> one, one last que- one last question before yes. you go. One last question. Yes. We ask this to most of our guests. We're in the middle of a pandemic um, and people obviously been really struggling in 2020. Yeah. What can you leave the viewers and listeners with on tools to get out of really down moments to pull yourself out when it, when it looks pretty grim? I think it's just that general positivity of like, I just had this chat and it's not about the pandemic, but with the the unexperienced first year Grand Tour riders uh, in our team two days ago in, in one of the hardest stages and they're all shitting themselves. And I sat mm. in the bus and I'm the one laughing and everything. And they're like, why are you so calm? And I'm like, because it's going to come to an end. Like you're going to get through it. It's going to suck for a little bit, but it's not all, it's not the whole day. It's not your whole life you're going to feel this for. It's not like you just got diagnosed with cancer. You know, you're going to get through it. And then tonight we're going to be sitting at the, you know, we're going to be sitting at the, uh, the dinner table and we're all going to be laughing and saying how horrible it was, but you'll get through it. Like you'll pass it. There is ways. But if you, I think if you, if you, you know, the analogy that I used before, if you go down the rabbit hole, it's the, the further you go down, the harder it is to come back up again. Um, yeah. And I think we're all in a priv- privileged situation where we don't have normal lives and the normal stresses that, that some people have, especially Europeans in the pandemic and, and losing jobs and having everyone locked up in their houses. You know, I think we're incredibly, it's sometimes easier to look at people in more unfortunate situations than you are and really reflect on it and go, my life's really not that bad. If this is as bad as it gets, then I've had a pretty good run, you know? Mm. So yeah, that's, uh, that's my drop the mic, uh, moment mate, for you guys. What a way to finish. You're an absolute yeah, legend, Rory, good, and all the best oh, in your thanks, final mate. week, mate. Thanks guys. See you later. Cheers, mate. Well done. Cheers, mate. Wow. That was I'm, I'm lost, lost for words. That was absolutely brilliant. And the guys are yeah, backing great. up on the comments. Thanks, guys. Brilliant. Yeah. Thanks, Rory. Great chat. Cracking podcast tonight, gents. Um, that, yeah, that was so good. He's such a great yeah. insight to the sport. Um, yep. Brilliant. Fantastic. Well, we had originally planned to preview the Tour de France route. Maybe we skip that and do that tomorrow night on the episode because we should. I think, yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, I think the route's not going to change from now until Good idea. Dan, though, because it has been announced today, are you okay with just mentioning, I remember the last, because it starts in Brest in uh, Brittany, right? And the tip uh, of, <laughs> right yeah, I know. the tip of Brittany is Brest. <laughs> And you did a Triple J. You were doing crosses. That's live right. crosses to Triple J Radio back in the day when we were working for Fox Sports. And yes. I still, and I had to remind you what you just said to them because for me, with my sense of humour, I thought it was quite funny. What did you say to the guys on Triple J that w- where we were? I, I said, uh, yeah, I think it's the race is starting in the Breast region or hmm. something. I, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. We're starting in the Breast region. And, of course, my sick <laughs> sense of humour, I just thought, I'm not sure you understood exactly what you said then. You may need to explain uh, what the Breast region 
is. It's a town in that's right. Brittany. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Cracking yeah, so days. So that's starting. So that's going to be yeah. a cracker. Yeah. Um, so you write to come on tomorrow night, Scotty? Yeah, yeah, sure, absolutely. Sweet. Well, we'll unpack the, fans, the Tour de France. If the, fans, if the wheel wizard's not too happy with my beard, um, and he can get past that and just don't go too far down the rabbit hole of uh, being upset by my beard, then I'll I'll come back. Oh, well, well, Gar- even, even Gary, the wombat breath said, "Great show." <laughs> it was Gary who just asked the question a few minutes ago. It was his question the other day. Uh, what's happened to Scotty? He got the lemonade, but we never actually put that one up. But uh, he hasn't got the lemonade to start. He's still here. Yeah, we back. just I'll... we wanted him to be fresh. As we said on the detour, we manage people. We don't burn yeah. them out. You got to manage your uh, your body and your your podcast uh, throat. Exactly. So. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, thanks again, boys. That was a cracking show. I'm actually going to go back and watch it again and watch it on days when I need a bit of inspiration. That was an absolute belter. So, uh, yeah, tomorrow night we'll unpack the 2021 Tour de France route and we'll see who else we can hook on our podcast fishing line. Stay tuned for that. See you then. This is the winning ride of the Tour de France.